Hello, literary themes and poetry students. Today we are going to be discussing a poem by the Canadian Sri Lankan uh, author Michael Andachi. Uh, I'll begin with a little biographical background on Andachi. Uh, Michael Andachi is a very famous uh, top tier contemporary Canadian author. He was born in Sri Lanka. Uh, which is off the coast of India in the south. And he emigrated initially to Great Britain and then to Canada. Uh, I believe he came in the early 1960s and spent a little bit of time um, in, uh, in the eastern townships, actually. I believe he went to uh, Bishop's University for a brief period. He ended up uh, moving on to Toronto, the Toronto area, where he lives uh, now, and I believe he's on faculty at, uh, I think, Queen's University uh, in the Toronto area. Uh, he's most famous as a novelist. He's written a number of very well-known uh, novels. Most famous, probably, of all of them is The English Patient, which was, I believe it won the Booker uh, Prize for the most important Commonwealth novel uh, in English. And it was also made into a motion picture that won nine uh, Academy Awards directed by Anthony uh, Mingala, very, very well-received movie version. Uh, his novels tend to be kind of complex, very fascinating, uh, worth reading if you're looking for an interesting read. Uh, certainly The English Patient, uh, In the Skin of a Lion, Divisadero, uh, his most recent one, or a, a very recent one, it might not be the most recent, is called Warlight, which is quite good. Uh, I can heartily recommend all of them. I quite like his fiction. Uh, but he also uh, started, actually, as a poet. And so uh, what we're going to be focusing on today is one of his uh, poems entitled The Cinnamon Peeler. Uh, if you have not already gone to the link, I have included uh, with today's information a link to hear Andachi reading the poem, then I would say you might want to take advantage of that opportunity if you have it. So click on that link and listen to him read the poem before we begin to discuss it. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there are a couple contexts for considering this particular poem. Um, as I said, Andachi comes from Sri Lanka, and Sri Lanka is a country that has had a very uh, complicated history uh, there was a civil war there. There's a, a group known as the Tamil Tigers, which were a, a terrorist group that uh, disrupted the society. And you basically have uh, two factions within Sri Lankan society that were uh, frequently uh, committing horrific acts against one another. Actually, the whole um, the contemporary mania that we've seen in previous years uh, with uh, sort of radical Islamic fundamentalists uh, using suicide bombing as uh, a terrorist vehicle <clears throat> um, is something that seems to have taken uh, its roots in Sri Lanka. They were, this is in probably, you know, 30 years ago, uh, where many people involved in the Civil War uh, used suicide bombing as uh, the way to commit uh, their terrorist acts. So uh, the society was sort of in a bit of upheaval for a number of years. Uh, and again, if you follow that in the news, uh, there's huge uh, Sri Lankan communities, I believe most notably in Toronto, in the Toronto area. And so there was a whole, while, while that civil war was going on, uh, Canada was actually involved because people on both sides were uh, getting involved from Canada, sending money to these various groups. And so there was a whole lot of uh, political tumult related to that. So anyways, what's, what's important for the purposes of the poem is not the uh, political backdrop in Sri Lanka, but just to sort of situate that this is an Asian country with uh, relatively conservative uh, religious views. Uh, there are lots of Hindus, lots of Buddhists, um, and you have a, a very kind of conservative uh, Asian, Asian sort of set of values. That's important because the poem is kind of conjuring that, although in a vaguely indirect way. Um, 
And so you have a whole lot of exotic imagery in the poem. Uh, I'll read through it, even if you've heard Michael Ondaatje read it. He probably reads it a lot better than I do, but that's okay. <clears throat> if I were a cinnamon peeler, I would ride your bed and leave the yellow bark dust on your pillow. Your breasts and shoulders would reek. You could never walk through markets without the profession of my fingers floating over you. The blind would stumble, certain of whom they approached, though you may, might bathe under rain gutters, monsoon. Here on the upper thigh, at this smooth pasture, neighbor to your hair, or the crease that cuts your back, this ankle, you will be known among strangers as the cinnamon peeler's wife. I could hardly glance at you before marriage, never touch you, your keen-nosed mother, your rough brothers. I buried my hands in saffron, disguised them over smoking tar, helped the honey gatherers. When we swam once, I touched you in water, and your, our bodies remained free. You could hold me and be blind of smell. You climbed the bank and said, this is how you touch other women, the grass cutter's wife, the lime burner's daughter and you searched your arms for the missing perfume and knew what good is it to be the lime burner's daughter left with no trace as if not spoken to in the act of love as if wounded without the pleasure of a scar you touched your belly to my hands in the dry air and said i am the cinnamon peeler's wife smell me the poem um, is very sensual, obviously. Uh, it's, uh, it has a sexual quality to it that some people have uh, been slightly taken aback by. I don't quite see why that would be the case, but uh, that is the case, apparently. Um, and as I said, we're, one of the contexts of the poem is a sort of a conservative uh, morality about sex that is uh, addressed, certainly, within the body of the poem. Um, it begins with a conditional statement uh, which is important, I think, because the context of the poem is sort of ill-defined. Um, if I were a cinnamon peeler, I would ride your bed and leave the bark, the yellow bark dust on your pillow. Um, now that framing, that uh, uh, that conditional statement that begins the poem is is important because uh, a conditional. Can, there are three types of conditionals. The first conditional is typically a statement that is true uh, in the present or the future. Um, so if I win the lottery, I will buy a Ferrari. Um, the second conditional, which is what we have here, uses a past tense verb, um, but it uses a past tense verb to express something that is typically not true in the present. So for example, if I had a million dollars, uh, means that I do not have a million dollars. Um, and so that past tense verb doesn't refer to the past. When we use a past conditional, uh, we typically use a past perfect. If I had seen you yesterday, I would have given you a ride. Means I did not see you yesterday and therefore I did not give you a ride. So that's the third conditional. What we're dealing with, as I said here, um, is a second conditional. If you remember going back in the semester uh, when we saw Andrew Marvel's To His Coy Mistress, uh, that poem also began with a conditional construction. Had we but world enough and time, your coyness lady would be no crime. Okay, had we but is if we had. Uh, if we had enough time uh, means we do not have enough time. Okay, and so here uh, we have this, as I said, curious second conditional construction. If I were a cinnamon peeler, uh, means if, if I were you uh, is a way we express the idea of giving someone advice. If I were you, I would do this. I'm not you, but if I were you, that's the situation. So if I were a cinnamon peeler is suggesting that I'm not a cinnamon peeler. Um, it's a curious way to frame the poem because it's basically the, the whole poem uh, becomes this protracted um, imaginative leap. Um, and so if I were a cinnamon peeler, I would ride your bed and leave the yellow bark dust on your pillow. So as I said, um, the, the beginning of the poem situates us already in that sensual and sensuous uh, ambiance. Uh, if I were a cinnamon peeler, I would ride your bed. Okay, riding your bed uh, is certainly conjures uh, some image of sexuality and leave the yellow bark dust on your pillow.
um, is kind of almost like marking territory. Uh, now the yellow bark dust that's going to be left there is precisely uh, the dust of the cinnamon. And again, I don't know if you're familiar with cinnamon, I'm assuming you are, but cinnamon comes from a tree and it's basically uh, what happens is the cinnamon peeler is the title of the job of the person who peels the bark of the cinnamon tree. And what happens is the, the trunk of the tree is surrounded by this outer uh, covering, the bark, and the cinnamon peeler will go and cut that and peel it off. And then it is rolled up so that when you go to the store, if you go to the supermarket and you buy whole cinnamon, um, you typically have uh, like a long stalk and it's the dried bark that has rolled up um, and is now very, um, it has a very strong odor. Usually when we buy cinnamon, we buy it already ground, but if you buy it already ground, it doesn't hold its aroma and its flavor for as long. Uh, so if you buy it whole, then you can uh, grind it as you need it and you can get that aroma. So we typically, uh, we use it a lot when we're baking. If you're making apple pie or something like that, you'll typically use cinnamon. So that yellow bark dust is the cinnamon. Um, it's a yellowish kind of goldenish, a little darker than yellow perhaps, uh, but it's a dust when we grind it to powder. <clears throat> now here, uh, the situation, and this becomes the, the context of more or less the entire poem, is that the cinnamon peeler is marked uh, by his profession. And it's, he's marked in an olfactory way. When you're with the cinnamon peeler, you know it because he smells like cinnamon. And of course, the context of uh, this is, as I said, it's almost like an act of possession because he's speaking to a beloved, a woman that he's in love with, that he's actually having uh, probably sensual, sexual relations with. Um, and he's touching her and in touching her body, the powder, the, the cinnamon that is on his hands from his work uh, stays on her body. And of course, this is possibly problematic uh, because it leaves the aroma. So your breasts and shoulders would reek. You could never walk through markets without the profession of my fingers floating over you. The blind would stumble, certain of whom they approached, though you might bathe under rain gutters monsoon. So here we have uh, this act in the first stanza. He is riding the person's bed uh, and leaving this uh, little residue of cinnamon on the pillow. And in the second stanza, he's touching her breasts and her shoulders, and they would reek, they would smell. Um, now, one of the key things about this poem is uh, the sort of the frankness of it. Uh, we'll be looking at this poem in the context of some of the things we've seen throughout the semester. And in particular, if we think of the blazon tradition and the, the traditions uh, related to love poetry, obviously those poems, uh, when we studied them from the, from the commencement of the semester, uh, we were looking at 15th, 16th, 17th century um, poets. The, the social context of those poems was obviously very, very different than this one. Um, for starters, uh, the frankness here is just almost startling for some people, as I said. Um, so <clears throat> now there's the, the curious part of it is that the attitude conveyed within the poem is somewhat similar to some of the attitudes that we've seen previously. If you remember, uh, when we looked at poems from the 16th century and that time, um, the, the sensual nature of it, even though they were always talking about love, um, they were only infrequently talking about sex. Um, and of course, there are sort of cultural conventions around sex. I mean, it's not something that we talk about very openly and freely most of the time, much of the time. Um, it kind of depends on context. I mean, people have been having sex since the beginning of human history, uh, preceding human history. But uh, it's something that we have uh, an inordinate number of taboos associated with for a wide variety of reasons. Um, and so there's uh, this kind of censuring nature about sex. And of course, that's what happens in the poem is that there is this sense that the sexual 
and the sensual is cause for worry and concern. And the reason here is because this secrecy associated with this act is going to be violated. Um, and so even though he speaks, uh, <clears throat> he speaks of uh, the acts in a frank, straightforward way, uh, there's consequence associated. And of course, the way he speaks to it emphasizes the physical and sensual nature of it. Here on the upper thigh that is at this smooth pasture, neighbor to your hair, or the crease that cut your back, okay? The upper thigh and the smooth pasture, uh, neighbor to your hair, is obviously talking about uh, the pubic region. And so this is the area in the, the thigh, high up on the thigh. Um, and the second part of that, the crease that cuts your back, is talking about your butt. Um, and so the, the both aspects of this are talking about parts of the body that usually um, we don't talk about quite as much, let's say, erogenous and erotic, eroticized zones. Um, curiously, um, one of the other things he mentions here is this ankle. Um, and the ankle is, a, I think, a curious reference because in certain societies, um, ankles are also eroticized. It's kind of curious if you think, because there are certain societies where, for example, a woman's breasts are not something that people need to be uh, terribly preoccupied about. And so those societies, often uh, island cultures, women will go topless and the people are just used to seeing women topless and that's not something that upsets them. Obviously in our society, uh, that is an issue. Uh, you have uh, a whole lot of prohibition on women's, the parts of women's bodies that you're allowed to see. And there's obviously a double standard because men can go to the beach and go topless without any worry, but women cannot. Um, here, the ankle, uh, which is referred to, is also an area that is sometimes given uh, erogenous importance. And so, so in certain societies, a woman is expected, uh, if you wear a long skirt, you're covering down past the ankle, um, because those are things that you shouldn't see either. Um, so that's just, again, culturally defined set of values. Different societies have different uh, senses about that. But in general, uh, in, in many societies, not all, certainly, uh, but there's clearly a double standard and the way that women are expected to cover themselves and be sort of modest and modesty is often codified uh, by religion. So in this situation, uh, you have an intimate act where all of these areas that are supposed to be uh, sort of off limits are not off limits because this is consensual uh, to people behaving in, in private and they don't have to be worried about it. Um, and so you will be known among strangers as the cinnamon peeler's wife. Um, and so the whole, the whole beginning of uh, the, the poem, the, the first three stanzas, all focus on this description. First off, it's an imaginative leap. If I were a cinnamon peeler, um, and then you will be known among strangers as the cinnamon peeler's wife. Um, as I said, there's this sense of an act of possession. Um, the smell and the aroma is almost like this person colonizing this other person. I hope that uh, image doesn't bother any of you, but that there's the sense of um, kind of almost the way a dog marks territory. There's something animalistic about it. And here it's aroma. The, the, the aroma of the cinnamon marks this woman as his. Um, and of course, uh, the whole description throughout these three stanzas relates to uh, intimate sexual acts, right? The bed, the pillow, the breasts, the thigh, and all of this description of the body in very eroticized physical way um, is precisely the point of the poem. Um, so it is a sensual uh, and, and overtly sexual uh, poem that at its work here. <clears throat> in the fourth stanza, um, <clears throat> the poem shifts gears a little bit and we move from this uh, imagined present again with this intimacy to the past. I could hardly glance at you before marriage, never touch you, your keen-nosed mother, your rough brothers. I buried my hands in saffron, disguised them over smoking tar, helped the honey gatherers. Um, and so here the situation is, as I said, moving back to the past before marriage, 
Um, so we assume, obviously, in the previous stanza, he's mentioned the cinnamon peeler's wife. So there is uh, the sense of marriage here. But before that marriage, uh, there was censure. Uh, the couple was not allowed to be together. I could hardly glance at you before marriage. Okay, I couldn't even look at you or barely look at you. Um, and again, the, the context here is the family and the set of family values. And once again, um, we can look back to the beginning of the semester, the traditions of courtly love and all of these uh, love, the poetic traditions of love that really um, always turned around some element of uh, female modesty and that women were held to a very particular standard traditionally uh, with regards to their behavior. Uh, many of you, when you wrote your, uh, when you wrote your essays, there were, uh, I would say, a significant number of people in the class who wrote about Margaret Atwood's um, Helen of Troy does countertop dancing. And we typically, uh, when we looked at that poem, uh, the issue of how women were treated, this concept of slut shaming, uh, that if women behave in a certain way, uh, like the stripper in that poem, they're liable to be held for censure. Um, now, in this poem, obviously, it's something slightly different, but it's that the woman is not allowed to uh, be on her own with a man. Again, looking backwards, <clears throat> just recently when we saw uh, Emily Dickinson's Because I Could Not Stop for Death, where death was uh, pursuing the persona in the poem, and we had this concept of the chaperone riding with them, that sense of modesty, female modesty. A woman cannot be alone with a man, so you would typically have someone else, a family member, that would accompany them, because obviously um, if you might uh, want to have some sort of uh, sexual uh, adventure that you probably wouldn't have if your aunt or someone is sitting in the back seat behind you, all right? So there's always this sense of uh, someone else accompanying them precisely to inhibit and perhaps even prohibit uh, those, type of, those types of interactions. And so here, uh, the family is intervening. He can't look at her and he can't even touch her. Right? I could hardly glance at you before marriage, never touch you. Um, so there is a sense of uh, they have an appreciation for one another, uh, but the appreciation is grounded in something with a distance because they're not allowed uh, any kind of intimacy. Your keen-nosed mother, your rough brothers, um, very curious use of adjectives there. Um, obviously, your keen-nosed mother uh, resonates quite well with the poem because the whole uh, beginning, the whole first stanzas, uh, were focused on this idea of the cinnamon and the cinnamon peeler, and the cinnamon peeler and his wife uh, having this uh, rendezvous and uh, getting together and her being uh, marked by the scent of his profession. And so the keen-nosed mother is obviously problematic. The mother has a keen nose. In other words, she has a very acute sense of smell. Um, and so she is going to be uh, very alert and very attentive to the fact that the girl smells like cinnamon. And if she smells like cinnamon, that means that the, uh, the cinnamon peeler has been touching her. And that means that she has not been behaving with uh, the appropriate level of modesty that would be expected of her. And so uh, the keen-nosed mother and then the rough brothers, um, so characterizing the brothers as rough gives us a sense of physical menace. The rough brothers presumably are rough because they represent a threat to the persona in the poem, the speaker, that is going to possibly be uh, beaten up by the brothers because they're protecting the honor of the sisters. And of course, if you know anything about Asian cultures, um, that's a very big issue uh, because you often have uh, issues of what's known as family honor. And sometimes uh, young women who engage in um, premarital sexual relationships are sometimes uh, treated very, very badly by their family and in certain cultures even sometimes murdered uh, because of the honor of the family, that the brothers often take this as a mark of shame upon themselves, which is patently ridiculous, but it happens. Um, certain things happen in the world and some of them are we wish didn't happen and this would be one of them. And so the rough brothers signify this culture um, of of moral control and of even physical violent control uh, where the woman cannot, uh, cannot freely uh, engage in whatever it is that she wants to. 
uh, certainly the constraints of marriage are, are a, an important issue here that, you know, if you're married, you're allowed to do certain things, but if you're not married, those are uh, off limits. Um, that, you know, still exists to a certain extent in certain cultures, but obviously in 2020, um, young people uh, like you all in this class probably have a slightly different attitude about some of the things that we're looking at here. Uh, so anyways, the speaker and his beloved are uh, persecuted and their love and their erotic uh, entanglement here is something that is going to get them in trouble. Now, it's not clear that anything happened before they were married, but he's talking about how um, the, uh, the family reacted and the fact that he had to be careful about the way he acted. And so what did he do? Um, he may have restrained himself, but he may have tried to maintain the secrecy of their, uh, of their interaction. I buried my hands in saffron, disguised them, over smoking tar, helped the honey gatherers. Um, so he's doing things that will get rid of the smell of the cinnamon. He buries them in saffron. Saffron is a, a spice like cinnamon. Um, it also comes from a plant uh, and it's the stamen, I believe. It's one of the um, petals in a, within the middle of a flower that are plucked out and they're very, they're golden, they're very yellow and you use them if you make paella, a Spanish rice dish. Saffron is an important ingredient, um, but it has a very strong aroma as well. And so he buried his hands in saffron. The, the scent of the saffron will disguise the scent of the cinnamon. Disguise them over smoking tar. Uh, smoking tar is another uh, aroma, strong aroma, that will presumably eradicate uh, the aroma of the cinnamon that he's trying to hide and helped the honey gatherers the honey gatherers, the people who collect the honey, uh, also is going to be another aroma. So all of these are sort of alternate aromas to layer over top of the cinnamon to make his scent uh, somewhat anonymous. When we swam once, I touched you in water and our bodies remained free. You could hold me and be blind of smell. You climbed the bank. Um, this is an interesting one um, where the, the couple once, obviously speaking in the past again, um, were able to get together. Uh, they were together in the water and their bodies, uh, I touched you in the body, in the water and our bodies remained free. Um, now, it's a strange image here, but they're together in the water and the water is serving to neutralize again the aroma. It's like you take a shower, you wash off whatever it is that would, uh, you know, have a smell. And so here they're in the water together and he could, they could hold one another and the bodies are free, free of smell because obviously they're not free of one another. Uh, you could hold me and be blind of smell. Another curious uh, image there. Uh, I believe earlier in the semester we mentioned this, uh, the concept of synesthesia when you have a scent, uh, when you have a, a, a sense that is used to describe something that's not related to that sense. Um, so for example, when you can uh, smell a color or, uh, you know, the normally sense of smell is associated with aromas, color is a visual image associated with your eyes. And so something like that is an, an example of synesthesia. Uh, William Blake uses that in his poetry. Now that I think about it, we may not have uh, covered that poem. We may have jumped over it due to our chaotic scheduling this semester. Uh, but here, the, the idea of her being blind of smell, where blind is obviously a visual image and smell, an olfactory one, they don't connect to one another. But to be blind means that you cannot see. And so the clear formulation here is that blind of smell would mean that you cannot smell it. And so here they're in the water together and the water creates a buffer between them. And so uh, the family members who might be looking to uh, control the woman's behavior cannot smell uh, his cinnamon. And so they will not be aware of whatever it is that happened. You climbed the bank and said, 
This is how you touch other women, the grass cutter's wife, the lime burner's daughter. And you searched your arms for the missing perfume. Um, and so this idea of being blind of smell, which obviously is advantageous because that means that the girl's mother and her rough brothers uh, will not be aware that these two have been together and therefore they presumably will avoid uh, whatever kind of punishment or negative uh, retribution would be in store for them. Uh, but it's also can be seen as a negative thing in the sense that obviously now the the woman is censuring the man because the blindness of smell, this idea that he can touch her and his scent is not there, is also enables him to perhaps uh, be um, not true to her, to not be loyal, and to be having uh, to have episodes with other women. This is how you touch other women: the grass cutter's wife, the lime burner's daughter. Um, so the fact that he can touch her without smell, which obviously protects them from her family's uh, retribution, is also possibly something that he uses so that he can have, as I said, episodes with other women besides her. And so she's slightly um, saddened and taken aback by this. You searched your arms for the missing perfume and knew what good is it to be the lime burner's daughter, left with no trace, as if spent as if not spoken to in the act of love, as if wounded without the pleasure of a scar. Um, very curious phrasing here. <clears throat> uh, so the, the poem conjures these other women, the grass cutter's wife, the lime burner's daughter. Of course, one of the key contexts of this poem, which we might want to look at through a post-colonial or perhaps a feminist perspective, both of those would be perfectly viable, in considering this poem. Um, the, <clears throat> the situation here is the reference to these women, and you, we've noticed it already, that we the characters within the poem, the persona is the cinnamon peeler. He's the person who peels the cinnamon. He's defined large, largely by his task. And you notice that most of the people here are precisely defined by their tasks, the honey gatherers, okay, the lime burner, the grass cutter. Um, however, uh, the situation here is more onerous for the women because the women do not have a task, but they have a relationship to a man. So we have the cinnamon peeler is one person and the cinnamon peeler's wife is another person. And the honey gatherers, they just exist within the poem, but the grass cutter and the grass cutter's wife, the lime burner, and the lime burner's daughter. So each of these women within the poem, uh, the numerous women that there are, are all defined in relationship to their man. Um, that's actually not that different from cultural uh, norms in certain places. Uh, just to give you an example, if we think of uh, the, the study of onomastics, which is the study of naming, where typically names have been given uh, to people for their profession. So some of the most common names in English, like Smith or Miller, um, are related to jobs. A Smith is a person who works with metal. A Miller is a person who um, grinds grains and makes flour out of them. And so those family names uh, had their origins precisely in this uh, type of reality, where the person's job defined who they were. Sometimes people are defined by the place that they come from. So you have a whole class of names that associate people to their locality, to their place where they're from. Um, and similarly for women, um, obviously the cultural norms, which have changed a lot, particularly um, in contemporary Quebec, uh, it, this isn't so much the case, but for example, in my generation, uh, my parents' generation, let's say, um, it was quite common for women to take the name of their husband when they married. So when you have your, what's known as your maiden name, uh, which is the name you grew up with, uh, and then when you marry your husband, you become uh, Mrs. So-and-so, and it's the husband's family name. So uh, that's, that has a curious effect on a lot of levels, but basically it's a similar, um, slightly misogynistic tendency in society that women's identity um, is contingent upon 
their husband's identity. So, for example, when my mother uh, married, uh, I remember because she used to have letterhead uh, things that she would put on the envelopes, and she would even uh, address envelopes that she was mailing to someone, and her little sticker it said Mrs. Russell Adamian. Uh, Adamian is my father's family name, and Russell is his first name. Uh, and so my mother, who was Mary Spagnoli, became Mrs. Russell Adamian. So her identity just completely disappears, and she becomes Mrs. the person who is her husband. Uh, so that's sort of, you know, that's, again, that's less common nowadays, because more and more people, uh, particularly in Quebec, you very often have either a hyphenated uh, family name. When people marry, they can, they retain their names. And when the children are born, they receive both the father and the mother's name uh, and other things like that. But certainly those tendencies still exist. And depending uh, which part of the world you're from, uh, they may be more or less pronounced. As I said, this poem is dealing with an Asian uh, cultural context. And Asia uh, tends to be relatively conservative in a lot of those values. Again, that's a huge generalization to make. Uh, you know, almost half of the population of the planet uh, would be identified as Asian, and so you don't want to group too many things under one little uh, little umbrella. But certainly there are culturally conservative uh, places, and Sri Lanka would be one of them. So the, the issue of naming here and the way that the women are addressed within the poem could be um, possibly problematic, although it doesn't have to be for the purposes of the poem. Andachi is very clearly conjuring uh, the culture of the place. We've seen it with reference to the monsoons, which are obviously an Asian um, phenomenon, the various professions, cinnamon peeler and honey gatherer and lime burner um, are all, again, associated with, you know, a rural agricultural economy um, that could be associated with Sri Lanka. And so the woman here is associating herself uh, with these other women who are touched by the cinnamon peeler, but do not have a smell left. And of course, her feeling is that the smell and almost the associated possession that comes with it is part of what's beautiful um, about the encounter with this person. You searched your arms for the missing perfume and knew what good is it to be the lime burner's daughter, left with no trace, as if not spoken to in the act of love as if wounded without the pleasure of a scar. Um, so the lime burner's daughter, presumably this other woman that this, the cinnamon peeler might be having an illicit affair with, um, is in some way has something less because the smell and the attendant possession associated with it uh, is part of what's pleasurable here. As if not spoken to in the act of love, as if it's this anonymous uh, sort of just completely physical, pragmatic encounter. Um, it's a sexual act without any of the intimacy, without any of the, um, without any of the close personal connection, right? If you just have sex, but you don't even speak to one another, as if not spoken to in the act of love, as if wounded without the pleasure of a scar. That's a rather beautiful image as well. Um, wounded without the pleasure of the scar. The scar is something that's left after the wound. It's a reminder, it's a mark that's left there. Uh, we don't typically think of it as happy, but it's almost, um, it's, a, it's a physical marking, right? And so here, the pleasure of the scar is seen as something quite positive. So you have the act, and then you have the memory associated with the act. And so um, curious use of imagery. Certainly one of the things that's quite prominent, I would say, in Andachi's uh, poetry, because he has this Sri Lankan association, uh, very often, particularly in his early poetry, uh, there was a great deal of violence. And in his novels, that's also true, that violence, physical violence and sort of rebellion and um, kind of upheaval are often commonly rendered. And so this idea of the pleasure of the scar kind of fits in with that pattern of imagery that really permeates his, his poetry quite broadly. And so the final stanza, uh, wrapping up the poem, suggests, again, moving towards this presence um, and this feeling of, of intimacy between the speaker and the beloved. You touched your belly 
to my hands in the dry air and said, I am the cinnamon peeler's wife, smell me. So in that last stanza, we've gone beyond all of these different scenarios from the beginning, this description, protracted description of an intimate encounter, followed by the fear of being uh, recognized and being kind of outed by the, by the mother and the brothers, the family members, being aware of the illicit nature of the union of the speaker and the beloved. Uh, and then this imagining of these other encounters with other women when they swim in them, when, she, when, he, when the beloved uh, and, and the speaker swim in the water together and they can touch without uh, leaving a scent. And then the, the woman begins to imagine his illicit affairs with other women. And finally, in this last stanza, um, we have the two of them together. And again, from the perspective of the speaker, the cinnamon peeler, the man, um, suddenly there's been an inversion once again um, of those norms. You touched your belly to my hands in the dry air and said, I am the cinnamon peeler's wife, smell me. So the you <clears throat> here is referring to the cinnamon peeler's wife and the me, the my, um, and the I uh, would typically be the speaker. So you touched your belly to my hands. This is a rather curious phrasing because typically we think of the hand touching something and here the agency is inverted. Uh, it's the woman who is taking her belly and moving it or touching it to the hand. So there's kind of this unusual framing of who is responsible for the act. Uh, the woman is taking charge. It's curious that she is, uh, the part of her body that she's using is her belly, uh, which obviously would conjure, at least in the context of this poem, the image of perhaps pregnancy, that the woman's belly, uh, which is where the baby that would be produced by these intimate acts uh, is starting to grow, is being uh, propelled to encounter the hand of the man. You touched your belly to my hands in the dry air and said, I am the cinnamon peeler's wife, smell me. And so here the statement at the end is the woman taking center stage. And in for the entirety of the poem, um, she was busy hiding from the recognition of this, the idea that the two of them were together and that the scent of the cinnamon would mark them as being together and that everybody would know about them being together. Uh, in this last stanza, after she's recognized that having uh, an encounter without the smell wouldn't be the same. And so in a sense, acknowledging, openly accepting or being, uh, you know, if we think of the expression of being out right, which we use frequently to talk about homosexuality, where you're sort of proud to recognize what it is, uh, whatever your particular orientation might be, that you can do that with pride. In a sense here, we have something similar, obviously something very different in the sense that we're dealing with a heterosexual couple, but something similar in the sense of the pr proud recognition of the nature of the connection. And so the, the speaker here uh, at the end is referencing the beloved, the you, um, and he puts the words into her mouth. You touched your belly to my hands in the dry air and said, and then we have, you know, sort of recorded speech here, I am the cinnamon peeler's wife, smell me. And so the I has shifted from initially uh, the cinnamon peeler to the cinnamon peeler's wife. And as I said, there's a, there's a real sense of uh, converting the agency of the poem and the woman is the one who has accepted uh, and taken sort of taken charge and taken uh, responsibility and you know is proud to state it and of course they are a couple we've seen reference to marriage before um, this is clearly a love poem uh, but it's a again an unconventional love poem due to the fact that uh, the cultural norms that are being sort of addressed by the poem are slightly different than the ones we're used to. Even though it's a modern poem, it's addressing uh, conservative mores and things like that. And so that gives it a slightly different twist. I think it's a curious one uh, as, we, as we 
inexorably move towards the end of the semester. Uh, this is a good poem for us to think about with respect to some of the previous poetic traditions that we've looked at. As I said, we talked about that with Atwood a little bit, and some of you wrote about that. This is another poem that we can, uh, we can look at in that lens. So uh, that is our lesson for today. I hope you have enjoyed uh, Andachi's The Cinnamon Peeler, and we will have only one more class lecture to do, and then next week we will be working on review and preparing to wrap up the semester. So I will talk to you more about that in our next class period. Have a pleasant day.